I was born a Yankee. I was born in, in New York City, in Queens, and you know, I'm a Yankee all over. And when I went down to the South it, in North Carolina, what I found is just about everything has a story or a song attached to it, so hence my title. Um, what we do is we look at early events in memory carcinogenesis, particularly looking at breast cancer initiating events in, in um, high-risk African-American women. And all this started out as sort of a basic R01, and NCI, uh, Suresh Mola, came to me and he said, we really need you to go out and translate. This is what we've got you here for. This is what we've been supporting you. And so hence, this is what followed. Um, I'd like to tell you that there was a grand plan involved. Uh, there really wasn't. I think one thing led to another, but ultimately the driving force was that in order to study the events that lead to breast cancer in high-risk African-American women, we really needed to be able to enroll these women in our trials, and so here we are. All right. So Triangle region of North Carolina, so that's Durham, North Carolina, and some of the surrounding counties has a very high incidence of breast cancer. Clearly, access is an issue. There are a lot of women who don't get access to screening services or treatment. But also there's evidence that biology may play a role. A lot of women, particularly young African-American women, get triple negative breast cancer. But also there's a suspicion that the environment may play a role. So it turns out up until about 15 years ago, as the South started to industrialize in Durham, what happened is that they were taking their toxic waste from the factories and they were spreading it out on the roads where the kids played in poor African-American neighborhoods. And all those chemicals are likely still there in the environment. So there's a lot of different factors that may contribute to the high incidence of breast cancer death. Now, we wanted to look at breast cancer initiation in young African-American women. So these are women in their 30s. So these are women who are busy with their children. Likely they have teenagers. A lot of women are working poor. Many women don't have any insurance all kinds of barriers. Plus, Duke and the town have historically not had a very good relationship. So to go in and say this is something that we wanted to study in individuals was, I think, a little bit more than, well, initially we thought, oh, this would be a great idea. And then we realized how complicated these issues were. So the first thing we needed was we needed to develop community trust. And this was the initiating work of a woman named Stephanie Robertson. And Stephanie Robertson was one of my medical transcriptionists. And she went forward and started our navigator team. And then she was joined by Lamisha Banks and Ziamara Boyce, who is a Hispanic um, navigator. And so together, we then formed a free clinic, and this is Ann Ford who runs the free clinic. So this is a clinic that's situated in downtown Durham. It's affiliated with Duke, but it's not a Duke clinic. We then um, developed a breast cancer access screening program. We had access to our specialty care program, so women who were found to be high risk could come directly to my high risk clinic. And then another important component was to provide mentorship for young individuals within the community. The idea is, you know, I'm a Caucasian lady. I was acceptable to women in the community, but what they really wanted was an African American physician. So it was very important to build new scholars to go forward. The thing that we found is after a lot of years of relationship building, we found that our community partners actually came to us and they said, we have specific questions. And it took a long time to develop this relationship, but once we did, we found that our community partners were not shy in saying what they were interested in. And so, and, and interestingly, the issues that, the, that our partners were interested in were some of the same issues that were also driving our scientific investigations. So, Question one, they wanted to know who gets breast cancer? What are the high-risk neighborhoods? Can breast cancer screening be improved? All too many young women got breast cancer and died before they would even begin to start getting mammographic screening. There was a question about how is this breast cancer started? What are the initiating pathways? And then the last question was, can we find acceptable prevention agents that are acceptable to not only us as investigators, but also acceptable to the community? 
So the first thing we started to do is geospatial mapping. So this is a mathematical tool that allows us to start to look at incidents over time and with spatial relationships. It allows us to look at incidents and cross county borders, so we're not defined by a county. So this is Durham County here, and all the blue dots here are incidents. So these are women under 45. These are African American women under 45. This is the incidence of invasive breast cancer. This is mammographic screening. And then this is the detection of precancer. And what we found is for all women and also for African American women, that the ratio of precancers to invasive cancer was very low. So we were finding a fair number of invasive breast cancers, but we found very few precancers. So we were having a failure of our screening program. And we, we hypothesized, and this is something that we're still investigating, that what happens is when a woman gets a mammogram, it's because she has a mass, not because she's going in for a specific screening program. Okay, so we used our geospatial mapping to also target some of our neighborhood interventions. We situated our uh, free clinic right in an area that had a very high incidence of uh, breast cancer. We target, targeted various neighborhoods for screening, and then we also had a block walk where individuals would go from door to door knocking on doors and say, you know, have you had your mammogram? If not, here are free resources for mammographic screening. So little by little, we started to build the capacity to ask scientific questions. The next question we wanted to ask is, can breast cancer screening be improved? Now, I started with the idea, as I think most people, that cancer is an event where one cell goes bad and then it gets bigger, 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 and this is a disease of aging. But when we start thinking about some of these very young African American women who get very deadly breast cancers, that model may not hold. So we had to really think about what are our models that we want to use for looking at high risk women. So usual risk woman, she gets her precancer 40 to 50, cancer 50 to 60, symptoms after 60. So breast cancer typically is a disease of aging. And this is where you have your breast cancer task force recommendations focused on these individuals. But we found that there was another group of women who had an orderly progression from 30 to 40 to 50. It's just everything occurred earlier. But then there were this, also, this other group of women who got their early symptoms at 30, and by 33, they would be dead. And this is the, the group of women that we wanted to focus on. Okay, and the problem here is that if you start getting your mammograms at 40, these women would be long dead before they were eligible for their first mammogram. So you could say, yeah, of course mammograms are gonna be a failure in this population because their breast cancer occurs too early and too rapidly to be caught. <coughs> The other thing we wanted to think about is what was our model of breast cancer initiation? So back in the early uh, 90s, the late Helene Smith proposed a model of breast cancer initiation. And what she proposed is that breast cancer developed in a high risk field. So this is an area of the breast that contains molecular changes that promotes the survival of a second hit. So her model said that during puberty, you would have the clonal expansion of a small number of cells to form a field within the breast. So if everything went fine, you'd have a normal field. But if one of these cells got damaged along the process, instead of having one abnormal cell, you would have a whole area in the breast that was damaged. And this is an important model of environmental carcinogens because we have young people right now who are eating a lot of junk food, they have early puberty, but they don't have normal nutrition. So we have, for the first time, a disconnect between nutrition and the amount of calories that people are taking in. So our young people are not getting normal amounts of B12 and folic acid. So nutritionally, they're starved. And this can set individuals up for abnormal methylation of tumor suppressor genes. And then these individuals have early puberty, probably because they've gotten a lot of caloric intake. So this is a, this is a potential model for looking at what happens to individuals early on in cancer. The model also has important clinical implications. So this is one of my 
wayward patient. So this is a young woman who's 30 years old, and she had an area here. This is a breast MRI. So this is an area that <coughs> rapidly got our attention. So she's a 30-year-old BRCA1 mutation carrier. Her mother and sister all had breast cancer at age 30, so this is an abnormal area. This really got our attention. Now, with this patient, she, like some of our other high-risk patients, even though she was very re well-resourced, she was very smart, very well-educated, she got very scared, and she went AWOL on us. And so we called her and begged her and pleaded her, and we said, please, you know, come in for a biopsy. She finally had a biopsy, but this turned out to be benign tissue. Then we needed her to come back because just because you find benign tissue in this in this situation, you can't just let it go. So we called her again and begged and pleaded, and she wouldn't come back. Eventually, I kind of violated HIPAA, please forgive me, and she, I knew she had an appointment with another physician, so I came knocking at her door, and I said, you remember me, please, we need to get another breast MRI. And she burst out into tears, and I said, look, I'm gonna be out of here, I'll leave you alone, I just want one more MRI. And she said, okay, I'll get the MRI, but go away. And this is what we found, okay? Now, we really agonized over this for a lot of reasons. When somebody goes AWOL and they come back with a large, and this turned out to be a large triple negative breast cancer with multiple positive nodes, fortunately it wasn't metastatic, we really agonize. Um, but the, one of the things we really thought about is what the origin of this thing. Did we miss the biopsy when we bi biopsied that area? Was this the origin and then little went to bigger? Or when you start to do 3D image reconstruction, we found that there was this sort of lacy area here that was fed by this blood vessel and this is where you start to see your, your angiogenesis for the tumor. So one of the questions we had was, was it little goes to bigger, or was this evidence for a high-risk field? Maybe this was truly a fibroadenoma, and we really did get the spot, and the breast cancer was coming from this area. The reason this matters tremendously is if your model of cancer is that little goes to bigger, you want to have really high resolution MRI where you're able to find the tiniest little spot here, biopsy it, and then that's what you use for your high risk screening. But if your breast cancer is coming from a high risk field, that opens a door to biomarkers and early detection because you can't find the one little cancer cell or the one little abnormal area that gets to be a big cancer. But you can go in and you can start to screen this area here and you can start to develop your biomarkers. Now, with this patient, we will never know. But what we wanted to do then is go in prospectively and start to look by MRI what happens. How do how does some of these young women get breast cancer? So this is where we brought in our navigation and community partnership team because what we wanted to do is look in young 30-year-old African-American and high-risk women for breast cancer initiation. So Coleman provided the funding for this trial. They allowed us to go to um, be able to provide MRIs for women who normally didn't normally get MRI. And we were able to lead our trial out of our high-risk free clinic. Now, we found, we, we were able to look at 300 um, high-risk premenopausal women. About half of the women were African-American, half were Caucasian, and after 48 months of observation, we found around 28 breast cancers. So this is a very high-risk group of women. And what we found is that while some of these breast cancers looked at least morphologically like little goes to bigger, and so this is an example here, right here, a lot of them, at least morphologically, provided evidence for a high-risk field. So here is a woman who we obtained screening. This is 36 months, and we found this tiny little area here that was too small for us to biopsy. We were able to come back in a year. It finally got big enough for us to biopsy, and this turned out to be a tiny little ER-positive breast cancer. 
this is a little poopy thing that's just kind of pooping along. It's not going to go kill anybody. So this is somebody who really probably didn't benefit from all this high-risk screening. This is somebody who, you know, this breast cancer could have gotten substantially bigger and this person would have been fine. Now in contrast, we have this woman here, and this is a woman whose sister developed, uh, she had regular breast cancer screening, who came in one day and had widely metastatic disease. So this, so we, we were screening the sister of this woman. And so what we saw here is this is zero months and then six months, and we looked at this and we said, well, you know, there's some increased <coughs> uptake here, but we don't really know what this is. And then at 12 months, we found two simultaneous triple negative breast cancers. So when women come to us in the community and say, my breast cancer developed overnight, at least by MRI, we can say, yes, there are some breast cancers that have very rapid progression. Now, all this imaging here is about $10,000 worth of imaging. And as a nation, we cannot do high-risk MRI screening on every woman. We just can't afford it. So what we really want to do is to be able to go into the breast and take a look at some of the activated signaling pathways so we can figure out who's going to do this and who's going to go do this. And for this, we needed quite a bit of community buy-in. Okay. So the question is here, what are some of the signaling pathways that predict these very aggressive breast cancers? Can we detect them? When can we detect them? Do you see activation during atypia? Or is it later that a breast cancer acquires its aggressive phenotype? So to do this, we started using a technique called random periolar FNA. This is a technique where you go into the breast and you make multiple passes through the breast and aspirate cells out. It's a technique that's pretty invasive. It's one that we were not sure we would have community acceptance. It was developed by Carol Fabian. There was a lot of controversy when we started this technique. But if you think about it conceptually, it's just like kind of taking a vacuum cleaner to the inside of the breast and vacuuming out cells that are not very tightly adherent. So the cells that are most piled up, that have the most cellular disorganization, are the ones that you get out first. So we so far have been able to enroll 325 subjects. Actually, we're now up to about 360 at Duke, and we have another 225 at Ohio State. So this is a technique that initially we had a lot of questions about, but we've been able to get good community acceptance and a relatively high degree of, of minority um, accrual. The power of this is you can take sample A at one time, sample B the next time, so you're able to go into the breast and prospectively start to sample cells in women who have not yet gotten cancer but are at very high risk for getting cancer. We got together with our CLGB partners and we looked at the reproducibility of atypia in this technique. That's very important because if you're using something as a surrogate marker of risk, you better have it be reproducible. If you want to say, I've intervened, I've gotten rid of the atypia, you got to make sure that the atypia is going to be there each time you go back. So we accrued 63 women over six months. We had five institution buy-in. This is the uh, determination one, determination two. This is a line of agreement. And you can see that there's a very strong line of agreement, even though all the cohorts from which these women came from were quite diverse. Okay. Now, Carol Fabian has been able to show that the presence of atypia in our PFNA predicts prospectively that a woman is going to develop cancer. So this is another important aspect of a biomarker because you have to make sure it's reproducible, but you have to make sure also that when it's positive, it actually means something. So this is data from Carol Fabian's cohort. It was published in JNCI in 2000. So basically, this is the incidence of breast cancer, and this is the time from study entry. These are women with atypia. These are women with no atypia. Women with atypia got the cancers. Women with no atypia didn't. This study was criticized because it was a single institution study. So we then worked to try to replicate Carol's work. This is something that's um, in submission. Again, number of cancers, time. This is from our cohort. These are women with atypia, women with no atypia. Women with atypia get the cancers. So this was a very important determination that this technique, that the presence of atypia has meaning in terms of progression uh, to invasive breast cancer. Now, so this allows us to start combining our imaging 
with the RPFNA. So this is a woman who had a breast cancer here. This breast was radiated, so we were starting to track what happened in this breast. This woman developed DCIS. We biopsied her. We were able to watch her sequentially. This, the cells look totally normal. Here, this is where we got atypia. We gave her arimidex, and then we had clearance of the atypia. So it allows us to start to combine the imaging and the RPFNA at the same time. But it still doesn't tell us about biology. So in collaboration with Chip Petrocoin at George Mason, we started profiling the cells that we get from our PFNAs, from, from the cytologic procedure. This allows us to take cells out of the breast, <coughs> microdissect, and then what we're able to do on nitrocellulose filters is spot the protein in limiting dilution and then hybridize with a phospho-specific antibody. It's a potentially good technique, but it's got some flaws. Second generation is going to be, I think, a lot better. In the end, anybody who uses phospho-specific antibodies knows that a lot of these antibodies are dirty, and that meaning that they produce a lot of bands on a gel. So this is you know, basically a protein dot plot where you just plunk the protein down, and then you see what sticks. It's got good points in that you can use small amounts of sample, but second generation uh, protein microarray allows you to then start separating all the different proteins. So you electrophorese the, um, the, the filter, and that allows for resolution of specific phosphoproteins. So this is a technique that's in evolution. What it allows us to start to do, though, is it allows us to start microdissecting out some of these atypical clusters, and it starts to allow us to look at the hierarchy of what happens during the evolution of a cancer. So we can look at cluster one, cluster two, look at the protein signaling pathways, and look at how they're related to the signaling pathways that are deregulated in a um, cancer. <coughs> So this allows us to really start to get into the breast, look at the epithelium, look at the stroma, look at cytokine signaling, and start to look at what is the biochemical pathways that are activated in atypia, and are all atypical clusters same, the same or different? So then what we wanted to do is go back to our cohort and start to look at what signaling pathways are deregulated in high-risk African-American women. So this set is 77 women. Uh, about 45% are African-American. With our proteomic profiling, we were able to look at, at approximately 60 phosphoproteins. Now when you do gene chip experiments, what happens is you have to look at thousands and thousands of transcripts. The advantage here is these are all our friends. I mean, we know about all these proteins. We've studied them for 20 years. We know the relationship between AKT, mTOR, PI3 kinase. These are all proteins that we know what their relationships are, who signals to who. So actually, you end up needing to look at a lot less number of proteins than you would if you were looking at a, at a uh, mRNA uh, array. So these are some of our results. Um, so we found that there were three high-intensity clusters. The first one had activated AKT mTOR, IL-6, STAT-3, and insulin. Second, EGFR, MAC, ERK, HIF-1 alpha, so a hypoxia, triple negative activation. And then the third one had mitochondrial um, survival proteins that were activated. Okay, so we got our ways of getting cells out of the breast. We can image, we can start to protein profile. Next thing we did was we went back to the community and we said, okay, we want to start talking about prevention agents. Now, we have a promise grant with MD Anderson, and the goal is to start using targeted agents for prevention of breast cancer. So this is path, this is our high intensity cluster one, and this is you know all kind of laid out here with some of the, the proteins that are activated. So we put those all up, started figuring out what the relationship was, and we started looking at what particular inhibitors might be useful under the circumstance. We knew that AKT, mTOR, STAT was important. We knew that IL-6 was important. Um, and we also had some suspicion that some of the energy balance and insulin signaling proteins were also activated. So we went back to our community and we said, okay, we have all these potential agents. <coughs> what would you like to do? 
And so what happened was our community partners said to us, uh-uh, this is not gonna work here. You're talking about inhibitors that would cost maybe fifty to $100,000 for a woman to take for one year. We would be happy to participate in a trial, but we have to participate in a trial that is gonna lead to something that a woman with no insurance could afford. What good is it if we find something that works and then nobody can have it? And so they basically said, we refuse. So we've got, you know, our MD Anderson partners are saying, oh, we've got this great Essex kinase inhibitor and a SARC inhibitor, and we're saying, please, 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 and the community's like, no. So we said, okay, what is important here? What do you care about? And they said, well, women are not just breasts. Women are whole women. And women in our community are not just getting breast cancer, but they're getting diabetes and heart disease. And the same women who are getting diabetes and heart disease are the same ones who are at risk for breast cancer. So we want a prevention agent that we think will address everybody, not just the breast part. Because you know, you talk to women about tamoxifen, and everybody goes, "Yeah, okay, so we're going to increase our clotting, we'll increase our stroke risk, we may gain weight." They said, "We don't want another tamoxifen. We want something that's heart healthy and helps to prevent diabetes." So I said, "Okay, great. I'll go think about it." And so I spent about three months just sort of cogitating over the data and thinking about it and talking back and forth with our community partners and asking, you know, would this be acceptable? Would this be acceptable? Okay. So then I actually went back to the data. And I started thinking about, you know, AKT mTOR has a high degree of overlap with insulin signaling. And I'd never really thought about insulin signaling because I was much more interested in AKT mTOR and I was sort of holed up in my little cubby hole and I never really thought about some of the other pathways that might be intersecting with the pathways that we found. Um, one of the things that turned up in our, our cluster one were insulin signaling pathways or insulin signaling proteins. So what's known is that AKT and it will activate mTOR and S6 kinase, but also AKT will go and mobilize the GLUT transporters. These are transporters that suck glucose into the cell. And that AKT and insulin receptor substrate one, which is a downstream target of insulin, have a positive feedback loop. So I said, okay, well maybe this could be a potential starting spot. The other thing that was found by our collaborators, Chip Petrocoin, is that there are feedback loops between AKT, mTOR, and S6 kinase where that feeds back to IRS1 and shuts down this pathway. So you have positive feedback loop here, but you also have a negative feedback loop. And what Chip found is that in some high-risk rhabdomyosarcomas that you have a burnout of this feedback signaling. So if you could think about a woman who had high insulin levels, you get a strong stimulus for this pathway and that eventually you would start to burn out your, your negative feedback loops. So if a woman has low glucose, then what happens is that turns on AMP kinase. And AMP kinase will inhibit mTOR and if you have low insulin that goes with the low glucose, that also starts to shut down this pathway. So women who have low glucose and low insulin will have a shutdown of this cancer signaling pathway. Okay, if a woman has high glucose and high insulin, this pathway is going to be going full tilt because you'll lose your negative feedback here. Insulin will be feeding into this pathway, and particularly if you have loss of feedback, what will happen is that this pathway will be highly stimulated. And we, when we looked at our cluster one, we found out that we had high phospho-ACC as well as our mTOR and Essex kinase as well as IRS1. So this is the pathway that was activated in our high-risk women. Now, the other thing that I never thought about because I'm a cancer oncologist is diabetes. Diabetes was somebody else's disease. You know, I don't do cardiovascular stuff. I don't do diabetes. You know, I just focus on the breast. But our community partners were really bugging us and saying, you know, when you see somebody in your clinic, why aren't you looking at whether they're pre-diabetic? Why do you have to send them to a specialist? Why do you, set, you compartmentalize your care? 
So we started going back to our high-risk women and started looking at how many people were insulin resistant. Now, insulin resistance was a term that I learned in medical school, but I think I didn't really understand. What insulin resistance means is that you make a lot of insulin, but it doesn't do you a whole lot of good. So it's just the same as any old regular insulin resistance. And what you do to test for insulin <coughs> resistance is, oops, sorry, you take women and you test for fasting glucose and fasting insulin. So you find out what their insulin is at the beginning, what their glucose is. And then you give women something called a glucola. If anybody's had glucola, it is really memorable. Anybody had glucola? Yeah, it's, it's really gross. It's basically the sweet stuff, terribly sweet. It's horribly sweet. Even if you like sweet stuff, it's just gross. OK, so women will get the glucose load here. And then you measure in two hours what happens to glucose and what happens to insulin. OK. So in one of my high-risk patients, and we found quite a few women like this, what happens is after two hours, glucose goes back to normal. So it's normal here, normal here. So normal glucose, normal fasting insulin. You give the glucola, you get the glucose back down to normal. But the amount of insulin that's required to tamp down the glucose is huge. And if you start thinking about the signaling pathway here, if you had a high-risk, African-American woman who was high risk for breast cancer and she was pre-diabetic and she was pumping out insulin, this would be a very bad pathway to be able to activate. So we said, okay, how about metformin? Metformin has been shown to inhibit gluconeogenesis. It's a diabetes drug that is used for type 2 diabetes. You have inhibition of gluconeogenesis, secondary decrease in insulin, but you also direct, you have direct inhibition of mTOR and S6 kinase. A lot of the AKT mTOR inhibitors are clinically very, very toxic. They're not things that you can give in a prevention setting. But metformin is inexpensive, it's off patent, the side effects are very reasonable. So we presented this to our community partners and they said, okay. Metformin also has been shown to lead to weight loss as well, particularly in combination with an improved diet and exercise. Okay, so metformin, what that will do is it will activate AMP kinase, it will inhibit mTOR S6 kinase, lower insulin, so it will be effective in shutting off this pathway. So we thought, okay, we've got a winner that affects the signaling pathway that we detected and also is acceptable to our community partners. So one of the things that we wanted to do, because I like to work in the laboratory, is just look at potential synergy, because we would predict that, for example, a SARC inhibitor and metformin would be um, synergistic, as would an S6 kinase inhibitor and metformin. And so we went into the laboratory and we tested in 3D culture. So this is a 3D culture system that's been set up for testing drug synergy. We saw very little effect when we put our cells into 3D culture. So basically they grew into fairly large depolarized um, epithelial structures. But when we combined the two that you had many more of the um, of a polarized epithelial phenotype and we were able to show that in 3D culture. So this is the combination. We see laminin and um, we saw activation in caspase 3. So if you go into 3D culture, we can see potential synergy that we would predict from our model. So we're about to launch a metformin prevention trial. Uh, we're going to do this in combination with our PFNA. We are working with our community partners to make sure we have high African-American uh, accrual to the trial. But the other nagging thing in here is while we know that metformin will affect this arm of our signaling pathway here, we have IL-6 signaling, which is another branch of the signaling pathway that we see activated in our high-risk patients that we predict will not be affected by the metformin. IL-6 is affected by vitamin D. If you have low vitamin D, uh, you'll have activation of your adipocytes, put out a lot of, of um, IL-6. Exercise also has been shown to reduce IL-6. So we think that potentially we may need to shut down this part of the pathway as well as this part of the pathway. The strength of our approach is we can look at particular phosphoproteins and very directly test 
which part of the pathway we've shut down, which one we haven't shut down. So we can look at phosphostat, serine 727, and say, have we shut this pathway down? Tyrosine 705, and say, okay, have we shut down this pathway? So we can go into the breast before, look at what's activated, do our intervention, and then say what we've shut down or what we haven't shut down. Okay, so, all right. I think I'm gonna, so one of our partners, Lee Jones, has also started to look at women who are exercising. And one of the things he's found is that IL-6 can be inhibited by exercise. So these are women who undergo forced exercise trials. And he's looked at VEGF, IL-10, interferon gamma, kerosene kerosinotype growth, growth factor in IL-6, and IL-6 is certainly reduced. So this will allow us to then start to go in, look at the cytokines, look at the signaling pathway. So in conclusion, we think that this approach is viable for being able to look at interventions before and after the administration of a targeted agent. We've been able to be able to get community buy-in. We've been able to get women from the African-American community to be willing partners in this trial. We found that some of the agents that maybe we wanted to test wouldn't work with our community partners. So we really had to say that a true partnership means that we go back and we revise our plan. Um, so we're about to launch our metformin trial with monitoring, and then we're also doing a lot of in vitro modeling, which I tried to avoid because talking about because I, I wanted to make this a mixed audience talk. So thank you very much. And this is, yeah, all the people, so. So another agent that can be uh, easily administered is aspirin. And so my question is, is do you have any idea whether there might be some sort of cost to plan in the mediated pathway mm -hmm. that might also, you know, yeah. uh, be responsible for microphone to atypia and whether low-dose aspirin might actually contribute? Yeah. So the Carolina Breast Study would say that administration of aspirin and non-steroidals, but particularly aspirin, should be preventative. Um, we wanted to start with the metformin, but aspirin would be something that we could integrate in very easily. So we, what we envisioned is a series of stepped prevention trials where we would try one intervention, then see what happened, reassess and then add another one. Aspirin would be very acceptable. Vitamin D repletion would be another acceptable thing for um, African American women because of dark pig pigmented skin, but also because of danger and violence in the environment. Any any mom is not going to let their kid go out, and so, you know, we had a really hot summer, as I'm sure you guys did. Nobody went outside, and in my African American patients, we would see vitamin D levels of like five, with 30 being sort of the acceptable norm. Um, so vitamin D repletion would be another thing in combination with maybe exercise, walking. I, I think ultimately we're probably going to have to look at a lot of, you know, the, the, the hope is you can just give one thing and get an effect. But I think that we're going to have to probably look at a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a little bit of that. And I think aspirin would be a good addition. Yes, sir. So I have uh, three uh, questions. One is uh, when you do your aspirin, you get fluid, you analyze it, or fluid for some of the things that we yes. have especially fluid in a certain prostate lamp. Yeah. Second uh, question, you used to have Wendy, the molecules. Yes, one, one afraid, who's now at UAB, yeah. yes. We used to be uh, doing all the exercise together, yeah. doing the press and heroin to see if there was any change. And the final question was on that uh, one young woman who a year later had that real density. Uh, was it, it looks like it would be a three, four centimeter uh, mass. What is that density? Seven centimeters. But, so was she totally, I mean, is, was that really a mass, or was she, that she was totally unaware? She and her newlywed husband were sitting there feeling this thing grow bigger, 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 and refusing our calls. In the, the eight years we've had the clinic, we've had 
three women who have done this, all wealthy Caucasian women, all well educated. The last one was two days ago and we are still, you know, she sat there and she said, well, you did a biopsy, you found a fibroadenoma, and I thought that this seven centimeter mass here was the biopsy clip. But so the, the density that you see on MRI is really a full mass. Sometimes it does correlate, well, that, that you would feel generally, but you can't feel all things. So I think the issue of what causes a mass is really interesting. And so one of the things we're doing is we're collaborating with Val Weaver to look at tissue tensile forces to look at the um, particularly AKT uh, PA3 kinase signaling pathways to see whether a stiff um, stroma will go and lead to women who don't or you know, don't have a, a mass. So we're looking at, at tissue tensile forces and the effect of tissue tensile forces on AKT. So the fluid we're definitely analyzing, and so that's where all of our cytokines studies are coming. And we looked at the IL-6 levels relative to phosphostat and also uh, relative to vimentin and found that the levels of IL tissue IL-6 from the aspirate correlated very well with the level of, of stat expression with our proteomics. In regard to Wendy. That would be a really good one to look at. We we just did our we did an initial pilot and we will add leptin when we go forward. So all the adipokines we're going to go look at. Um, Wendy we published with and before she left we did a RPFNA atypia study. We're going to go. We put in one proposal that didn't get funded with Wendy. Um, Lee Jones is still at Duke, so we're talking about doing a. Wendy, UAB, Duke joint exercise trial. Um, I'd really like to try to do this through our cooperative groups. Um, since she's no longer CLGB, it makes it a little bit more difficult, but we're just going to keep on doing it until we finally get funded. So, yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> there seems to be a lot of studies on metformin. Are, are people also looking at Aptos or combining Aptos and metformin? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question, and I apologize. I don't know the answer. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in metformin. Um, it, we're, what I'd really like to see is, is a combination of exercise and, and metformin, but the problem is that this is a drug that does so many different things, and you know we worked really hard to get very specific targeting agents. This is a really, in quote, dirty drug that does a lot of stuff. I, I really think that you know the, the, um, a lot of our, our recent trials with Avastin really underline the fact that we got to have the biomarkers to know what we're doing. Otherwise, we'll get all these results and we'll say, oh, metformin doesn't work. But it may work in certain circumstances in certain women, or there may need to be other things added. And I, I think we need that kind of trial design for testing a lot of different agents, whether we're talking cancer or not cancer. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you looked at the IGF-1 in addition to insulin uh, mm -hmm. uh, following uh, uh, glucose or uh, basically high glucose levels, yeah. whether there is uh, actually elevation of the IGF-1 that goes in parallel with the insulin or yeah. whether, whether there are differences in, in what it actually I think that's a really good that's a really good point. The second cluster that we saw um, has has um, dysregulation of IGF-1 signaling, and we're working with Randy Jertle to look at. So, um, the IGF-2 I think receptor is imprinted, and so we want to look at not only the IGF-1 levels in the tissue, but we also want to look at imprinting of of the receptor as well. So, yeah, yes. Uh, so you've got higher patient population, you've got pathways that you're interested yeah. in. You undoubtedly have polymorphisms that cut across these, especially yeah. with, the, with the intervention. Are you anticipating that in your analysis? So we bank Sorry, DNA. Is the question? I couldn't hear, I couldn't hear. Are we looking at polymorphisms? And yeah, so we banked the DNA from all the patients, and we are looking for collaborators. So if, if anybody's interested in doing, you know, high-resolution sequencing on these patients or looking at specific polymorphisms, we would be very interested because all these women have banked 
sequential DNA. They are totally annotated and we have enough longevity that we know who got cancer and who didn't. Um, it's not big for an epi study, but for a biologic study, it's it's pretty decent for looking at association. So we would really like we would really like to look um, at collaborating. So, all right, so, yeah. So you you is quite young. Do they have um, the after you identify the high I, I'm sorry, what? Who you who the yeah. MI scan? Yes. Yeah. So we, so for women who are really young, we like for example twenty. We really try to avoid um, mammography in that patient population. For some of these high risk women, we will do like a digital mammogram, maybe one at thirty five, and then we'll we'll kind of look at see how useful the mammogram is for the woman. Do they have low density or high density. A lot of the African American women have relatively low density, but the issue there is, it, is that it isn't necessarily that they have a fatty involuted breast, it's that the women are larger than the Caucasian women and um, you know I think some of the discussions we've, we've been having is you know how do you start to look at women with low density, but yeah they all have, they have ma ma mammograms, they're all you know, IRB consented, the mammograms are available, and we have matched MRI, and a lot of the women um, also had other imaging studies that went along with that, so like tomosynthesis. Yes? So you've been looking at activation of signaling pathways because you're using yep. antibodies against phosphorylated proteins. Yeah. I'm sure everybody you know has their own favorite yeah. biomarker that they want to put on Yeah. <laughs> right, so, so what's the capacity of this? Okay. Right, because often, you know, you see upregulation and downregulation, yeah. not necessarily. So we think that 60 is about the right capacity. We might be able to go up to 100. We've started to integrate people's biomarkers in um, because I am like so overextended, I can't even tell you. I make them do the work with with George Mason to, but like for example, we had somebody wanted to study snail, and that's a logical downstream target for us. So we had them, we gave permission for them to work with the people at George Mason, and what they want is an antibody that produces a single or ideally a single band on a Western blot, although if you look at some of the AKT antibodies, it's like, yeah, right. Um, but we were, we were able to add those on, um, and then we're working with somebody else to add another biomarker that looks like it may be associated with triple negative breast cancer. So we're, we're very open to adding specific um, markers. We just ask that, A, the antibody be relatively clean, and that the person does the work so I don't have to go do it. Um, and that it'd be some, something that's associated with triple negative breast cancer. One of the things that we haven't added on enough is some of the TGF beta SMAD uh, proteins. And I, I think we got to go put those on too because it's clear that with some of these initiation signaling pathways, that the TGF beta has got to be playing a role here. And that's one thing that we're not adequately capturing. So the answer is we add as long as I don't have to do the work. Okay. Yeah. So is there this, this uh, how metformin works? Does it actually bind directly to uh, the uh, molecules? I mean, that PK, or does it uh, does it actually uh, have an indirect role? I apologize. I'm going to sound really stupid and say I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm not clear how you. In I mean, the the inhibition of the mTOR um, S6 kinase is through secondary effects of, about, of uh, AMP kinase, but I don't know exactly, how, and I should know, um, how metformin inhibits AMP no, kinase. It's okay. Okay, thanks. It's okay. Yeah. Good form and excellent. Yeah. Yeah. But it's low affinity. It's a dirty drug. I think the going story is that nobody knows precisely. Yeah. Well, that okay. So that's why, like, yeah. Okay. That's that's very helpful because I. There's a variety of targets, but nobody knows. Well, the other thing is like all. Yeah. 
all these drugs that we use, the affinity or what, what happens and what's stimulated is very dose dependent. And so you start to look at the binding coefficients for some of the drugs that we use and we look at what the therapeutic doses are and they're way higher than what you need to saturate the receptor. And so, you know, I think we don't completely understand what a lot of drugs are doing, but I agree with you. I think metformin is particularly mysterious. And one, one thing I'm going to be very interested in looking at is when you give metformin, do you ultimately affect IL-6 signaling? Because you might. I'm not sure how, but I could, com I could come up with a potential scenario of affecting inflammation in the breast or, you know, et cetera, and maybe affecting both TGF-beta and IL-6 signaling. So it'll be very interesting to look at this, at the protein signaling pathways, to see what exactly gets turned on and off. And with looking at the phosphostat, we can really start to look at which arm of the signaling pathway is turned on and turned off. So, so yeah. Pam Goodwin from Canada, she's doing a trial, crystal trial on the metformin and the breast cancer Is she really truly giving the secondary effect of metformin on the insulin? Yeah. The effect the supply of the other reactive directly yeah. on the yeah, I, I, I mean, that I would tend to agree that, especially if you think at how insulin is positioned relative to IRS-1 and AKT mTOR, that the shutdown of AKT mTOR as 6 kinase may be through secondary inhibition of insulin signaling. Um, so I think, you know, again, it's a dirty drug with a lot of effects, and, and you need to have tracking if you're going to go. Well, you can measure the insulin system. So we can measure direct, we can, so with the women, with our trial, we'll measure insulin resistance before and after administration of the drug, so we'll be able to track what happens to insulin resistance in the individual. So good. I have a question around who you collaborated with to do the geocoding. Uh, Marlon Miranda. And, you know, where, where is that for anyone? What's their background and how they get engaged? Okay. But I also have a question around um, in continuing to engage the women and what kind of infrastructure you have in place to, um, I presume yeah. you have feedback opportunities yeah. and so for the So for the first question, um, and I should have said so, our collaborator is Mari Lynn Miranda, who is from the School of the Environment, and she's done amazing work. So what she did was she's, uh, she does children's health, so she went out in the Durham community and started to map what the lead levels were in the community. So it used to be before a kid would be born and then you know they'd be lost to follow up and then six years later they'd come back because they wouldn't be able to read and then they'd measure their lead levels and say, oh gee, no wonder they don't read. But at that point the damage would be done. So what she did is generate a map of Durham based on income, s sampling, and um, the age of the house, and uh, a, no a number of other factors. And then she was able to put into public policy that when a kid came in, they would geospatially map the kid where they were living, and then what they'd do is they would draw a lead level before the kid led the, left the hospital, so they would know high lead or low lead, and then they use those neighborhoods to target where they would put intervention in. Um, in terms of your second question, our high, our high risk clinic is really important in, out in the community. It's really important for dissemination. So we've had a number of events where you know they've been surrounded by it could be a somebody graduates from college and we came in there and we talked about some of the results. Um, we just try to disseminate in a non. PowerPoint format. Our, our community partner said no PowerPoints. We are so sick. Every time we see a Duke person, they've got a PowerPoint, and we don't want, <laughs> we do not want PowerPoints. And so we said, okay. They said, we want real conversation person to person. If you cannot say it without your slides, then we don't want to hear about it. So, you know, marker, board, and conversation. So, yes, sir. So if, for these uh, early atypical patients, are you looking at the characteristics of stem cells? I would be very interested in looking at that. We have lost a lot of our stem cell people at Duke, and we are looking for a collaborator. Because I think you know that's going to be at the bottom of some of these, especially if we can start to see EMT so early. It, this, these have to be stem cell-related breast cancers. Okay. 
Great. Thank you very, very much, everybody.